part of a, a wider formulation uh, and some of the practicalities and then you know think a wee bit about some of the benefits and some of the potential drawbacks or, or costs. Uh, next slide please. Okay so uh, the, the NHS Highland Personality Disorder Service is a multidisciplinary specialist service uh, which draws referrals from secondary care mental health services in North Highland. So that's as distinct from the Argyll and Butte part of the board. Um, and, and those referrals are for patients who cannot uh, uh, eff effectively be worked with or care cannot be effectively provided um, solely in secondary care services. And that's usually due to reasons of severity, uh, complexity or lack of treatment response. Um, we, we have a kind of <clears throat> a range of different strands within the service. We have direct treatment strands and we have indirect strands such as education uh, and awareness and supervision and consultation. But of the direct kind of treatment, direct clinical care strands, uh, assessment formulation and treatment recommendations is the first step that everyone referred to the service. Um, it's the first step in the kind of pathway and, it, and it's probably the most fundamental step in, in the treatment pathway. Next slide please. So uh, what is that step in the pathway? So essentially it's a co-authored multimodal assessment of a person's history and current situation. So when we talk about assessment it's not a clinician you know assessing um, a, a, a patient um, and you know, as Gordon said, I'm I'm, uh, I'm more than aware of, of the sensitivity of language around th this area. I will be using the uh, the, the term patient, um, and the reason for that is that in a lot of the work that we've done in our integrated care pathway, uh, that has been the preferred term of of people who have been involved with the service and have been um, patients, service users. Um, whatever other terms might be used, that's a preferred term. So there's nothing meant or implied by that, it's just a term I, I'm using. And I appreciate their drawbacks with all terminology. Uh, so we have a co-authored multimodal assessment of the person's history and current situation. So as I said, it's not an assessment of a patient by a clinician, it's an assessment of the person's current and past situation by the clinician and the patient together. Uh, and the co-authored bit, um, the, uh, I'll, I'll say a bit about that. The, the, the assessment's multimodal and it draws from multiple sources of information. There's a kind of a, a, a detailed history which with particular emphasis on um, uh, uh, looking at traumatic or adverse experiences in a systematic way, uh, looking at developmental history in significant detail, uh, various kind of um, uh, measures and, and questionnaires including structured uh, semi-structured interviews looking at personality traits um, a re review of, of, of psychiatric and psychological therapy case records speaking with the person speaking with some member of their social network speaking with members of their care and treatment team and all of this information is put together into a kind of draft uh, report uh, by the clinician and then that before it goes anywhere else goes to the, uh, the, the, the patient who will who will read it, uh, make any amendments, adjustments or additions and, and make sure really that everything's accurate uh, and that no kind of omissions or mistakes have, have been made. And on that basis, um, a formulation will be drawn when both are happy with it. A formulation will be drawn, drawn some of the key problems, goals um, uh, and, and, and barriers to progress. Um, to, uh, and when that's agreed, that will be taken to the multidisciplinary team to uh, put forward some treatment recommendations. Now that formulation um, is what we base our treatment upon. But a part of that formulation, and actually a, a, a necessary part, is um, the psychiatric diagnosis. But so it's not the main part, but it is an important part. 
um, and uh, it, 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 a psychiatric diagnosis, which is two, three words, cannot possibly hold the same level of information as an individual formulation. Um, but it is necessary for, for, for some uh, reasons, which we'll talk about now. Next slide, please. So psychiatric diagnosis, um, as a psychiatrist, you may or may not um, be su surprised to hear me say that I'm not the biggest fan of psychiatric diagnosis, uh, which essentially are represent sets of criteria which are agreed by committees of experts. Psychiatric diagnoses are necessarily reductive. Um, they're kind of nomothetic uh, rather than uh, ideographic. And by that, I mean, they're talking about groups of folk rather than an individual's story. So they're necessarily reductive. They're impersonal. They're imperfect. But they are also important. And, and they're important for, for a number of reasons. They, they can be useful shorthand to aid communication, but it's always important that one remembers the diagnosis is not the same as the individual uh, and forms just one aspect of, of the whole picture for someone, the whole situation that someone finds themselves in. Um, psychiatric diagnosis can support development and application of effective treatments and how we tend to work out if a treatment's going to work or not is we, we kind of rather crudely lump together folk who experience similar problems and um, give, you know, get, give them a treatment uh, and measure that against a similar group who receive a, a, a controlled treatment or a controlled condition to see if it, if, if it works. Um, th the other important point is that you know, for a psychiatrist uh, and for mental health professional, the application of diagnosis to guide treatment is an accepted standard and variance from this standard may, may be difficult to justify. So with all its drawbacks, um, th 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 there is some acceptance that this is the kind of um, standard or at least one well recognised standard that might be quite difficult to justify if, if, if that wasn't followed. Next slide, please. OK, so a wee bit of a timeline regarding uh, what our service did with regard to ICD-10 and ICD-11. So from about 2016, when, when the service was kind of moving into its kind of current configuration, uh, the early stages of its current configuration, um, we began to use kind of severity and trait domains uh, that were being discussed in the discussions of the development of ICD-11. Uh, and that, that they were used within formulation and diagnosis, but we continued to use ICD-10 as the, as the diagnostic tool. And the reason why we were using severity and trait domains were that that's, that's how we were thinking about um, problems uh, uh, problems in living for the folk that we that we see that we saw and that we seen, um, and that severity seemed really important as as it would be for almost any kind of any situation someone find themselves in, certainly any health um, condition, and the trait domains helped us think about uh, how we would uh, or what treatments we might recommend, uh, and and also kind of provided a, a link to. Uh, you know the, the wider understanding of personality uh, and, and the conditions that we call personality disorder are, are just one part of uh, you know the, the broader understanding of personality more generally. Uh, so we did that for about four years and in 2020 we uh, 2020 2021 we began using ICD-11 diagnoses alongside ICD-10 so we would we, we would, at, at the end, in that part of the formulation, we would give both of the, you know, the, the, the ICD and ICD-11 diagnoses. And from the 1st of January this year, we began to use ICD-11 only. Next slide, please. So why do we do this? Um, I, I mean, I think, bluntly speaking, ICD-10, DSM-3, 4, 5, uh, personality disorder categories really 
ha have have little scientific validity, um, and uh, there are significant areas of uh, disagreement between uh, the diagnostic systems. Um, you know, so, some subcategories are included in one, not in the other, and and so on. And there, there's recognition of a pattern of marked co-occurrence uh, of personality disorder subtypes together. Consanguinity, that's also called. And you have to excuse me a, a second while I stop the video. Sorry about that. Believe it or not, someone has decided to bring an industrial window cleaning uh, machine <laughs> right outside my window. Uh, so I'll, 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 I'll continue as best I can. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so uh, ICD-10 has no severity uh, dimension. Also, we mentioned that, and, and actually, severity is really pretty important for folk. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it's really pretty important for for the person that's experiencing uh, any particular uh, problem. And it's important to know, you know, w w when you're when you're helping work out what treatment might be helpful. A dimensional model is kind of more scientifically sound and clinically useful than a categorical model. And I, I, I'll not go into it in, in detail now, but a dimensional model is essentially talking about the, uh, the expression of particular dimensions or traits, whereas a categorical model is, is more talking about uh, archetypes or prototypes. And th this is a description of you know, a particular presentation. Um, there's extensive literature on normal personality trait dimensions, really extensive and emerging literature on disordered personality disorder trait dimensions. That's an inverted commas for a reason. And I think that the two, the, the thing about dimensions is that kind of uh, normal um, personality traits blend into, you know, the expression of personality traits that cause problems for, for people. Next slide, please. Okay, so these are the ICD-11 um, general criteria. So th they're similar to ICD-10. There are some differences, which I'll summarize at the end. So essentially, it's an enduring disturbance characterized by problems in functioning of the self or relationships or both. It's lasted for two years or more. It's problematic in terms of thinking, emotions, and behavior. It's manifest across a broad range of personal and social situations. It's not due to something else like another health condition. Uh, it's associated with um, uh, distress, substantial distress, and significant impairment. And I think some of the criticisms about mild personality disorder have been that, well, if it's mild, then, you know, people will say it's, it's none of our business. Mild personality disorder is still associated with substantial distress and significant impairment. So it's, it's not really that mild is, is another way of looking at it. Um, personality disorder shouldn't be diagnosed if the, the problems are developmentally appropriate or can be explained by uh, socio-cultural uh, factors. Okay, next slide, please. So this is the kind of grid that we use to think about the differentiation between the different um, slices uh, or different levels of severity. So you can see that um, we've got mild, moderate and severe at the top. Um, in terms of personality, uh, areas of personality functioning affected, mild personality disorder, some areas are affected mildly, moderate, multiple areas are affected moderately and severe, multiple or all severely. In terms of relationships affected, that goes from many, most, or to all specific manifestations of personality disorder. So these would be the kind of trait um, problems, mild, moderate, and severe. Level of harm can be none, some, or often. And sort of general functioning, um, mild can be kind of substantial problems in some areas or milder in more areas. Moderate is marked across multiple, and severe is most or all, um, severe problems in most or all. Next, next, please. We've also got personality difficulty, which I'm not going to in detail now, but that kind of sits below mild personality disorder, and that's long-standing difficulties that come about every now and again, or um, mild difficulties that are there more, more of the time, but don't cause the kind of substantial uh, impact in terms of distress or dysfunction. However, I think it is important to hold this in mind in that, 
sometimes people who are under particularly um, per particular stress, particularly stressful times in their lives, can present with um, a, a marked deterioration in their in their mental health and their functioning that doesn't look like depression. It doesn't look like an anxiety disorder. It doesn't look um, like any of those kind of common mental disorders. What it looks like is 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 uh, if it had lasted longer, being more pervasive and persistent, looks like personality disorder. But because that pervasiveness and persistence isn't there, it might be worth thinking about personality difficulty. Um, and field studies show that that's a, a huge um, proportion of the general population probably uh, experiences at some point in their life. Next slide, please. OK, so ICD-11, this is the kind of st steps that uh, we would take in making a diagnosis. So first would be g general criteria for personality disorder, which we've talked about. Are those met? Then is it mild, moderate or severe? We've looked at that. Uh, Next, please. And then we look at prominent personality domains. Next, please. So these are the five personality domains in ICD-11. Ne negative affectivity, detachment, dissociality, disinhibition, and anencastia. So uh, very quickly, negative affectivity is tendency to experience negative emotions. Detachment is social and emotional distance. Dissociality is disregard for the rights and feelings of others. Disinhibition is the tendency to act rashly. Anencastia is about perfectionism and, and, and excessively high standards. And then a, a car carrying over from ICD-10, because it is a useful uh, concept clinically, uh, and because most work in the field of personality disorder treatments, certainly effective treatments that has been done, is, is a, a, around borderline personality disorder. That has been kept, and, and uh, it's now termed the borderline pattern. Next, please. Borderline pattern is the same essentially as borderline personality disorder. So general criteria must be met um, and five of these nine criteria must be met. I'll not go th through these now. Um, however, they're the same as DSM um, three, four, five. Um, and I think, uh, you know, the, the same as DSM three, four, five in terms of five of the nine must must be met. Um, I, I, you'll probably note that almost everyone who meets criteria for the borderline pattern will also meet criteria for the um, uh, disinhibition um, and negative affectivity domains. Next, please. So those were the traditional nine criteria. Um, for borderline personality disorder. ICD-11 also adds these in, not as kind of necessary, but just saying that these can also occur. And it's interesting to uh, compare these with what Thanos was talking about um, earlier. So uh, as well as those nine, other manifestations might include a view of the self as inadequate, bad, guilty, disgusting, or contemptible. So as well as that instability, this can be present. An experience of the self is profoundly different and isolated from others, painful sense of alienation and pervasive loneliness. And the final one, which is kind of linked to the abandonment criterion uh, earlier, is proneness to rejection, hypersensitivity, problems in establishing and maintaining consistent and appropriate levels of trust and frequent misinterpretation of social signals. So those, th those three are, are kind of new. Next. So I talked a bit about the five factor model earlier on. So this is a kind of general one of one of the main kind of um, models for thinking about personality in the round, general personality. Um, and uh, it, 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 it puts forward that kind of personality can be thought in terms of these five higher order domains. So openness to experience, which is something like, um, you know, open mindedness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness and neuroticism and all of these things are dimensions with kind of high expression at one end and low expression at the other most folk in the middle uh, and distributed more or less on a on a bell-shaped distribution next please so as you can see just taken for example uh, uh, conscientiousness at kind of low expression that would be associated with impulsivity, carelessness, disorganization, and at high 
uh, expression, um, hard work, independable and organized. But I would say that at the highest expression, it's kind of perfectionism that starts to become a problem for that person and, and people around them. I, I, and that kind of um, dimensional uh, aspect is present for all of these. And these big five, which are kind of descriptions of general personality, map across um, to um, the five domains that we've talked about in, in ICD-11 to some degree. Can, can, can you move on to the next slide, please? So if you look here, um, Anancastia, or sorry, we'll start with negative affectivity. So if you look at negative affectivity, it, it correlates quite quite a lot with high neuroticism. Detachment correlates with low extroversion and low neuroticism. Um, conscientiousness, or sorry, sorry, dissociality correlates with low conscientiousness and low agreeableness. Disinhibition with low conscientiousness. Anancastia, which is that kind of perfectionism, um, correlates with low openness and high conscientiousness. So, so th th those are some of the kind of crude links between the big five and the five domains within ICD-11. Next, please. Okay, and, and you can you could you, you could break this down further and further. So these are the kind of um, the, the, the kind of 10 aspects. So each of the big five has can be broken down into aspects. A couple, two aspects can be broken down into facets, can be broken down into nuances and, and you can go down and down. But, but really, at some point, it starts to use a bit of utility, I think. Um, but actually, the, the kind of um, the, the, the aspects um, way of, 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 of breaking down the big five, I think, does have some um, clinical utility. Uh, and it's something that we use uh, with, within, a, within our service. But I, I, I don't have time to say much more about that uh, just now. Next, please. So um, we've got uh, uh, some changes from ICD-10 to ICD-11. We've got severity dimension, uh, mild, moderate, severe. We've also got the personality difficulty. We've got trait descriptors, uh, which we've heard about. Uh, we've got the borderline pattern descriptor. We've got the age criterion, which um, is a change. So. Previously, um, there, there, there was more, I think, of a reluctance to talk about personality disorder in kind of folk under the age of 18. Um, and I think that should still be done with, with real caution. But if the, the, the problems that someone is experiencing are not developmentally appropriate and are meeting all the other criteria, then it's something that could certainly be, be thought about. Um, it's, I don't think it would make much sense to be going pre-adolescence, and I don't think that it makes much sense to be conceptualizing normal developmental uh, behaviors and, and uh, uh, stages as, as personality disorder. But for some people, it, it clearly can make sense to do that. Um, persistence criterion. Uh, so in ICD-10, the, the, it, it talked about problems needing to be present from early adulthood. Uh, at the latest. Um, but we were certainly seeing lots of folk who were presenting much later in life with problems that look for all the world like, like personality disorder and responded to the treatments for personality disorder. ICD-11 talks about problems being present for at least two years and I think that's much, much more useful. Um, the stability descriptor, so ICD-10 talked about things, these problems being stable across the lifetime whereas ICD-11 talks about relative stability. And I think that's what we do see. We do see changes over the lifespan of um, uh, some problems related to personality may become more entrenched and some less so as, as kind of compensatory mechanisms uh, are learned. Uh, so we've got personality difficulty as a factor influencing health rather than a, a diagnosis in its own right. And we've, we've also got the kind of um, first inclusion of complex post-traumatic stress disorder in a major diagnostic system. Uh, and, and that I think that that's really um, uh, been a real step forward, because I think before sometimes 
when people were talking about complex post-traumatic stress disorder, they were talking about people who had experienced complex or sustained anticipated trauma. Sometimes people were talking about Judith Herman's conceptualization of complex PTSD. Sometimes people were talking about the complex PTSD, which which is more aligned to what we see now in ICD-11. So it's great that that's, that's now there and uh, that there's a very clear description of what, what's being referred to. Next slide, please. OK, so in practice, we, we moved fully to ICD-11 in 2022. And, and the question might be asked, what about historical diagnoses? So I think there's something about uh, the, the, the principle of parsimony here. And I think um, th th there's no need to go back over old diagnoses and update them um, unless it's necessary. I suppose that's what that means. Um, and uh, for some people it will, for some people it won't. So, you know, generally speaking, borderline personality disorder, mostly unstable personality disorder, more or less is equivalent to borderline pattern. Um, severity descriptor is quite important, but as you can see, that, that there's a fairly easy way to get a sense of the severity. We saw that uh, table or grid earlier on. One of the other big changes for us has been that we would um, almost never now diagnose post-traumatic stress disorder in someone who meets criteria for border border or, well for personality disorder but certainly not for borderline personality disorder and we would diagnose complex post-traumatic stress disorder uh, as well and uh, and I would say that half to three quarters of the folk that, that, that we see who who we do, who we see who meet criteria for borderline pattern also meet criteria for complex post-traumatic stress um, disorder. Uh, we do work in a kind of uh, a modular treatment approach. We work in a phase based approach. So what we would tend to do is to work at the kind of safety and stabilization stuff first. Uh, and that can be steps in the CMHTs, it can be DBT. And then we would look at the kind of PTSD cluster. Um, so while there's no sort of really robust evidence for the treatment of complex post-traumatic stress disorder at present. There is good evidence for the treatment of the kind of reliving, re-experiencing uh, re avoidance, hyperarousal cluster of symptoms, and there's, which, which we call, I suppose, traditional PTSD. Uh, and that can still be delivered to people that might take a form of trauma-focused CBT, either prolonged exposure or uh, cognitive processing therapy or EMDR or, or some other evidence-based approach. So uh, those would be the kind of approaches that we would um, take. Um, sort of more broadly, I, I've been having discussions with my colleagues working in kind of more general settings um, to, to, to uh, encourage them to think about personality difficulties as something that might be missing in their overall formulation uh, when they're when they're thinking about um, how best to to help someone and how best to to, to work with them towards uh, the kind of life that they want to be living. Uh, next slide, please. And this is the last slide, and this is just a kind of crosswalk between ICD-10 and ICD-11. Now, this is this is not necessarily kind of set in stone, but it's a useful thing to think about. So for, for down the left hand side, you have the old categorical diagnoses from from ICD-10. Uh, you've got narcissistic there at the bottom, which was one of the differences. ICD-10 didn't have that, and that was included in DSM. Um, and, and you've got kind of how that, those different uh, categorical diagnoses map across to the kind of trait domains in ICD-11. So someone with a previous diagnosis of paranoid personality disorder is likely to be scoring high in negative affectivity and detachment. Someone with a previous diagnosis of schizoid personality disorder um, likely to be uh, kind of low in negative affectivity, high in detachment, and so on and so forth um, down that grid. Um, I'll not I'll not go through all of it, but you can have a look yourself, and and, and you can you can see how those kind of map across to some degree. Um, but again, there's no substitute for speaking with a person, uh, getting as much information as you can from them and from as many different um, sources as possible, and then checking out with the person if that kind of reflects their understanding of how things are for them, and that kind of formulation with a diagnosis embedded within it is a very strong point uh, from which to kind of order 
uh, and and kind of guide treatment. Um, and and uh, although it's not um, although it's not ideal, the the the, 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 the 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 psychiatric diagnosis part of the formulation it is a really really important part, but it should never really be taken as the be all and the end all, and it should only be um, thought about in terms of an overall formulation. And the next slide, please. That's that, that's me finished um, for now. So. Um, thank you very much for uh, for listening. I'll hand you over to Gordon. Mm -hmm.